Good evening and welcome to the Australiana Fund's third online lecture for 2023. My name is Sonia Abbey. I'm the Australiana Fund's Fine Art Advisor. Before we begin, I'd like to note that the lecture is being recorded. So to enhance your viewing tonight, it's best that you put your Zoom screen to speaker view, which will allow you to see our speaker and then the PowerPoint presentation. And for the comfort of all participants, particularly our speakers, please remain on mute with your video camera off. If you'd like to ask questions during the talk, please send them through by clicking the chat button, usually at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as possible at the end. We ask you to please keep yourself on mute even during the, the questions, it's much easier. As many of the presentations in our series could be dense with images, there may be at times a delay in moving to the next screen. Um, so any potential um, technical difficulties, we'll try and provide the best experience for you tonight as the internet allows. So I'll now hand over to Jennifer Sanders, Chair of the Australiana Fund. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope that was seamless. Um, welcome everyone to our third online lecture. It's wonderful that we've now got a monthly series, given that it's still difficult for everyone to get together in person. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the peoples of the Gadigal Nation, of the Eora Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land from which I'm Zooming this morning. I'd like to also pay my respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. Tonight is the third of our 2023 lectures and it's focusing on Canberra. The title is Canberra's Modern Variations on a Theme. And the speaker tonight is Professor Nicholas Brown, who is in the School of History in the College of Arts and Sci Social Sciences at the Australian National University. In 2014, Cambridge University Press published his History of Canberra, and he has maintained an interest in the history of the city and its place in the wider national story. He is convener of the Canberra Museum and Gallery Advisory Committee and has served on the ACT Heritage Council. I was delighted when Nicholas agreed to present this talk. It's one which he first gave last March to the Australiana Society when they had a visit to Canberra. He presented that as the Kevin Fay lecture. Now, many of you will know Kevin Fay is a, was a revered authority in Australiana. He was also an inaugural member of the Fund's First Council and very, very important in the setting up of not only the Fund, but also in the Fund's collection. Nicholas is also an author in the Fund's book, Collecting for the Nation, in which he wrote the chapter, Canberra, the Bush Capital, which has got some wonderful observations about Canberra and its outstanding location. I'd now like to welcome Professor Brown and thank him for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you very much for inviting me to join you tonight. I'm now going to uh, attempt the, the risky thing of sharing screen. Now, is that right? Fingers up. Good, perfect. <laughs> uh, as Jennifer said, I gave this this um, this talk as the Kevin Fay lecture in March, and I'm rather shamelessly sticking to the text that I used then, even though one of the problems with Zoom is when you see the names come up, I realise that there are several of you out there who probably know a great deal more about the subject that I'm going to address than, than I do, but I'll, I'll just try and entertain, if not inform. So just to give some kind of background to where I'm coming from in this talk. I, I was delighted to be invited to give the 2023 Kevin Fay lecture. And as Jennifer said, building on an earlier association with you to, to support the, the enthusiasm with which the Australiana Society honours his devotion to collecting, studying and preserving the rich diversity of Australian arts, crafts and mature culture. But as in March, maybe even more so this evening, since you're all somewhere else, um, I'm conscious of a certain unsuitability in my role. As John Wade so eloquently evoked in his reflection on Kevin Fay's life and commitments, he was a man of fine detail who made the intricate, intimate study of crafted artefacts central to his work. 
explored through the complex fusion of imported aesthetics, colonial mentalities, local initiative and ingenuity, the making of a distinctive but deeply synthetic, pervasive and inclusive Australian style. As John Wade put it, Kevin, quote, transformed the idea of Australiana from the trivial of football, meat pies, kangaroos and Holden cars to show that there was genuine craftsmanship, style, cultural value and history here, particularly in colonial Australia. Kevin's works all emphasise the work, skill and creativity of our craftspeople and the way in which Australians have been influenced by the native flora, fauna, landscape and local materials. Kevin's work was devoted to colonial Australia. This, after, this evening, I'm really addressing 20th century Australia or mid 20th century Canberra more specifically. But I'm hoping that in what I'm saying this evening, I can translate a little bit of those fine commitments to, to my subject. I applaud Kevin's dedication and that of the Australiana Society, but I am not, never have been, and probably never will be a person of detail. The meticulousness of Kevin's work and his devotion to appreciating the sheer technical as well as the aesthetic demands of craft-based practice have never come naturally to me. So when I was invited to give the Kevin Fay lecture, I think on the basis of my attempt to integrate the history of Canberra and the style of Canberra back into the national story, rather than that customary narrative of the city being an aberration from that story, I was flattered, if a little bit daunted. I have offered uh, now. I have offered, uh, as Jennifer pointed out, a very broad brush account of that history or my take on it in a book I published in 2014. And in writing that book, I was often inspired by an observation, one of those very pithy remarks by Don Watson. Canberra is like no other Australian town or city, yet no other Australian city town or city could be more Australian. And it's that ambiguity, that tension to some extent, that I want to explore this evening. And again, reflecting back on Kevin Fay's contribution to articulating some deep synthesis, some intriguing synthesis that sits behind Australian design. Don't worry, I wrote that history of Canberra. I'm not going to give you a rehashed general Canberra history this evening. Because in this evening, in these brief comments, I wondered how I could assist in tying together the, the broad mission of the Australiana Society and that, I suppose, which I about which I know, know a little bit, the history of Canberra. And going back to the occasion of my remarks in March, I was I found out to my relief then that the tour of the Australiana Society was visiting Manning Clark House. And today I really want to focus to some extent on Manning Clark House as an exemplar, yes, an exemplar of the tensions in that fusion between the fine crafted object, the imported and the deeply local, uh, the, 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 the value of the past as it translates awkwardly to the preservation in the present. Because the fact that the Australiana Society, which I suppose I in my ignorance have always associated with a devotion to colonial and early 20th century arts and crafts, was visiting Manning Clark House, which to some extent is an exemplar of mid 20th century modern, uh, gave me a sense of how I might try and hook my interests to what I hope might be of interest to you, and to draw together some of the images that might have come from that group's tour of Canberra, some aspects of the society's devotion to the work of arts and craft, and something of my own experience and perspective as a historian of Canberra. So on the basis of that fusion, I can now say that I am genuinely delighted to be here, to seek those connections with Kevin Fay's work and to offer some thoughts that might serve to consolidate the ways in which Canberra, rather than being seen to be an aberration from the Australian story, can be made much more central to it. So. Let me begin by identifying some threads, threads that I will then attempt to weave together around my theme for this evening, Canberra's Modern Variations on a Theme. But let me start with another reassurance. My title will not lead into an academic taxonomy of modernism as applied to Canberra, interesting though it might be, or to celebrate the ways in which Canberra is an element of the creative infusion of 20th century design, arts and craft, although that is certainly one enduring aspect of Canberra's story, and one that I'm well pleased to say is gaining in recognition. 
You'll all be familiar, I'm sure, with some of those major icons of Canberra's modernity. And there are just a few in front of you in terms of architectural forms. But what is really reassuring most recently is that there are a group of young people, and I will be emphasising at various stages through this talk the kind of engagement that younger people are bringing to Canberra's story. There's already a group of very passionate and dedicated young women who offer a programme of events, of events in Canberra that does precisely that. Canberra Modern, who seek to take the, the architectural icons of the Canberra experience and develop their meaning as a lived reality. Um, they're en enormously innovative, enormously creative, and they're very effective in building those bridges. One of the functions that they hold as part of the, the, the Canberra Modern Festival is a martini whisperer evening in Manning Clark House. Now, those of you who've been to Manning Clark House or know anything about Manning and Dinfner Clark will know that I don't think they ever drank a martini in their life. It was usually something much cheaper and quicker than that. But nonetheless, the elegance of mid 20th century modern celebrated in the domesticity of Manning Clark House and the modesty of Manning Clark House is a very beautiful aspect of one of the fusions that that group seeking to re-energize modernism as a lived experience in Canberra is, is really exciting. But this evening, <clears throat> I am more interested in the kind of ambivalences, tensions, ambiguities that that modern project of Canberra as community and national capital has often had at its core. And to go back to, and, and to some extent, those tensions are part of the foundational dimension of Canberra. And again, without wanting to give you a, historical, a, a historian's lecture, let's just go back to some of those designs of the international competition of 1911. That's, I'm sure, will be familiar to many of you, number one. Marion Mar Marianne Marnie Griffin and Walter Burley Griffin from Chicago, their conceptualization of what the ideal city, as they put it, should be for the new capital of Australia. And as they spoke about that ideal city and their aspiration for designing it, Griffin spoke in terms of his admiration for the radical steps in politics and economics he admired in the Australian nation. This scheme was a bold vision of organic urbanism laid gracefully across the plains, framed by hills and mountains and infused with deep civic symbolism. That's to some extent the foundation for what we got, though you'll see that it's been trimmed a lot since then. This was number two. If we hadn't had Griffin, perhaps this is the design that we might have got, or maybe thank God we had Griffin, because otherwise this would have been the next on the link. This is number two by a Finnish architect, Eliel Saarinen. Heroic modernism, the transformation of the language, of the landscape, the transformation even of the people into order and system. This is number three by Alfred Agaché from France. Romantic modernism here, lives transformed by new technologies of transport, leisure and consumption. You can see the, the airship just drifting in from the left hand side of the picture. And this is the Australian version, uh, not in the top ranked prize winners, but ironically, for all its different formulations of modernism, the design that would actually probably win through, given that Caswell, Coulter and Scott, disappointed not to win the prize, nonetheless managed to maintain influential offices within the federal capital planning of within the within those who actually went on to plan the capital city and those of you who know the layout of Canberra might contrast those graceful those graceful linear structures of Griffin's plan to what we really got in those cul-de-sacs, those curvilinear suburb, suburban layouts, particularly in the older part of Canberra, particularly in those areas surrounding Manning Clark House. So what I suppose I'm suggesting so far, going back to those plans and to this plans, is that modernism was never a simple thing for Canberra. There were many various, many varied, conflicting versions of modernism that were being laid out over this landscape. They were always going to be compromised, uh, 
and they were always going to be in some kind of tension with each other and with the more pragmatic aspirations of those who actually took the bold vision and put it into practice. It's not easy to be a subject of modernity or indeed an object of modernity. The pace of change, the experience of impermanism, impermanence, the prominence of technology, the intensification of spatial, personal, emotional experience, the scrutiny of reason, the turn to science to explain identity, category, hierarchy, destiny, all of that is part of modernity. I promised not to offer you an academic taxonomy, but I am suggesting that all of those elements are to some extent floating in the air of those concepts of what Canberra might look like in those competitions of 1911. All I want to suggest is that Australia through the 20th century had plenty to offer the evolution of Canberra and the tensions in the evolution of Canberra in each category. And Canberra, unlikely as it might seem for the bush capital, became a local and a national crucible for them all. In the 1920s, the first planning body associated with the development of the city declared that Canberra would be, again in the words of Sir John Butters, the chairman of the Federal Capital Commission, the world's biggest experiment in the systematization of the happiness of humanity. And there he is planting a tree. But even that in a, in a bare, desertified to some extent landscape. But even that tension there in Butter's phrasing, the systematization of the happiness of humanity, I think captures an ambiguity that has always run through Canberra's experience. The Federal Capital Commission was far from the last such body constituted to give some of uh, some sustainable and affordable meaning to whatever that formulation might be. And also to begin with, Again, going back to that plan from Caswell, Coulter and Scott, there was a there, there was a series of competing local interests and international aspirations. Before I go any further, I should also say that I have a vested interest in seeking to lock this lecture, this this talk this evening so strongly around uh, the Manning Clark House. I am on the board of Manning Clark House. And I chair a subcommittee that is tasked with developing a strategic approach to its many, many conservation challenges. Because Manning Clark House, typical perhaps of mid 20th century modern, is a degraded, drifting, insecure site, not quite for sure of how its original conception relates to the changes of the present, which again is why the interest of a group like Canberra Modern is so exciting for us. I said I'm on the board of Manning Clark House, except board and subcommittee are pretty fancy terms to use for a cash strapped, purely voluntary and largely mature group of people who are seeking for a range of sentimental as well as principled reasons to keep intact what is essentially a modest family home. Yes, Manning Clark House is a Robin Boyd design and Boyd is an important exemplar of architect is, is an is a very important architect in Australia's story, arguably the most important architect of the mid 20th century, as well as a critic of Australian architecture seeking to move its registers in new directions. Boyd had a very equivocal relationship with Canberra as he saw it developing in the 50s and 60s. It exemplified, as he put it, featurism, the multiplication, the overlapping, the melange of different styles, to some extent, in Clark House again as a very modest commission, exemplified his attempt, perfected, uh, borrowed from his small homes ethos in the in the in the of post-war reconstruction to work with the needs and limits of individual clients' briefs, but to achieve a pure built form. And the Clark's resources were limited, with eventually six children, and coupled to Dimfler Clark's deep commitment to simplicity and to Manning Clark's waywardness. Boyd was an architect who was drawn into a number of commissions in those early years in post-war post Canberra. We can contrast the Clark House to that designed by Boyd for Frank and Bobby Fenner around about the same time. Fenner was a pioneering, if it, one was a, Clark was a pioneering eccentric historian of the concept of Australian history as a theatre of human complexity, 
Frank Fenner was a pioneering immunologist whose work on smallpox led to global and a highly successful campaign of mass vaccinations. The Clark House is modest. The Fenner House is a much bolder, more integrated, purer expression perhaps of what Boyd, with a little bit more budget and a little bit more style available to him, was able to achieve. But the play between them, both are integral Boyd houses, I think exemplifies something again of what I want to get at by looking at the way in which a Canberra's modern is always to some extent about compromise. There's a great book by Milton Cameron exploring the connections between the scientists recruited to come to Canberra in the 1950s, such as Frank Fenner, given the investment in what given the investment in what they offered the modern nation and the role of the national capital as scientists, and the architects they commissioned to design their homes, often with immigrant builders, highly skilled craftsmen built from Europe. The connection was not a coincidence. Again, Canberra at the, end of the at the end of the Second World War was about mobility, experimentation, the making of a city, a remarkable cosmopolitanism. Cameron's book captures those homes in a kind of specific moment of realization. Their time, the clean aesthetic of the just built, a machine for living in before they were actually lived in. This is not a criticism. That is one aspect of valuing material culture, the purely crafted form, capturing the moment and its context of creation. And to some extent, the Fenner House, uh, for reasons that are rather tragic in its way, never was knocked about by children. The Clark House, however, was. Modern childhoods were lived in that house. And as we know, and as I'll come back to you later, modernism as heritage does not always wear or work well. The Fenner House still can be seen as a pure laboratory. The Clark House again shows its wear. But maybe its wear is part of its value in terms of a crafted aesthetic object. The modernist ideals of efficiency, purity, functionality, order don't necessarily make for comfortable living. The modernist moment, faith in technology, planning, bureaucracy, the clear allocation of roles and identity does not always adapt well to social and economic change. And it's all, modernism is all just a little too close to a still, too familiar, too clouded in the subjectivities of memory, testimony, trauma and sentiment, not yet quite history to be readily accessible to us in the way perhaps that a colonial aesthetic can be. Canberra as it functions in Australian political culture, I would suggest, carries some of those burdens, even if the city itself, especially since self-government in 1989, uh, no, as, no longer quite fits the stereotypical bubble image. And Manning Clark House is, even down to the status of the eponymous head of the household, no exception. So let me now begin to unpack some of these suggestions. Again, in a very self-interested way, the thing I want to highlight and the thing that those who visited Manning Clark House from the Australiana, in the Australiana tour in March came to see was one of the major initiatives in association with the Alastair Swain Foundation, the Robin Boyd Foundation, that Manning Clark House has attempted to, to pursue as a way of finding our own priorities in a strained and rapidly changing heritage environment. Those of you who've been to Manning Clark House will know that it is to a large extent an unaltered, unrenovated, unimproved home, largely unchanged since the 1950s and proudly showing the wear and tear of the intervening 70 years. But it is still a striking house in terms of its craftsmanship, its integrated, understated style. Let me just pause then, I've jumped ahead of my notes. The thing that I wanted to highlight here is that in association with the Boyd Foundation, the Alastair Swain Foundation, we were fortunate enough to win funding to put together a 3D virtual tour captured by members of the Boyd Foundation with financial assistance from the Swain Foundation last year. And if you go to Manning Clark House, you can walk through the spaces, but you can just go to, you can click on the virtual tour and in a, in, a, in a wonderful, innovative exercise of the kind that the Boyd Foundation has sought to practice in other of its, of its premises, you can investigate the house and its layerings. So I encourage you to do, that, do so. 
because what the virtual 3D tour enables you to do is navigate through the house to explore its many dimensions, not just the architecture, but also the craftsmanship. Drawers in the kitchen, for example, that pull out on both sides, the management of compact space. So you have bookshelves that start halfway up the wall to make the most of floor space underneath. Shelves that begin at waist height to maximize floor area. The pallet consistent throughout the, the house of limed wood, bagged brick, but always, if you look up, the careful cut features that Dimfner gave to coloring the roof, in the ceiling in each room slightly differently. There's always Dimfner's hand, the blue and white curtains in the furnishings, the subtle differences of paint color on the, ce on the ceilings, so difficult to capture now. Uh, so, for example, you can see through in that top image you've got there the very intriguing colour on the roof, on the ceiling of the living room and the dining room. The story behind that is that when the house was being built, there are crabapple trees flowering in the neighbouring Collins Park. Dimfner and Manning lay under those crabapple trees. She looked up at the blossom and said, that is the colour I want on my ceilings in the living room. It's very hard to match that colour now. It's very hard to get exactly those kinds of settings. It's fading, dry, graying as it ages. But even there, there's a modest attention to detail, to place. It's flexible, adaptable domesticity. The 3D tour manages, captures not only the building, but the lives of those who lived in it. Here is one we brief excerpt. One on the door and yelling out, I'm in the bath, or hurry up, etc, etc. Uh, there were six of us and there may have even been more at times, uh, eight of course, with all the children here and guests as well. That's, that was our life. But that was the norm. I hope I've gone back to my, back to my slides. That's just one example of the kind of moment, the fusion of building, style, lived lives that the virtual tour manages to capture. It is a remarkable, effect, remarkably effective way of documenting, curating and presenting a heritage object. With you as a visitor determining the journey, whether you're on site using the QR codes or on the other side of the world. It allows a relatively seamless integration, integration of experience and interpretation. And it captures that elusive intimacy of Manning Clark House in particular, a modernist house, still pure in its light, lines and lineage, and a family home, scuffed, stained, cracked, worn, and in the jargon of real estate agents, a renovator's delight. Except Manning Clark House is heritage listed, and the block alone is valued and rated at $2.5 million, and the family and the board are not interested in giving it up, even though things are tight and the only revenue coming into Manning Clark House is a small amount we, we charge for people who take a tour of the house, because you don't have to pay for the virtual tour, and the public events we hold. As such, and as such in ways that Kevin Fay might have appreciated, with a great deal of complexity, Manning Clark House increases the prospects of engagement with the materiality of Australian culture, on the one hand, and the fragility of that same exercise that experience of the modern, that preservation of the modern on the other. That materiality is a home, garden, contents and aesthetics. Each one of those little red dots, if you click on it, takes you to an interview. Each one of those little grey dots, if you click on it, takes you to a feature of the house. So again, that grey dot in the middle on one of those drawers captures the ingenuity of a very small kitchen. The cutlery drawer opens both ways. So if you want to put the cutlery in your drawer after having washed it up, you pull the drawer one way. If you want to set the table, you pull the drawer the other way. It's a tiny house, really, a very frugal house. It's so cleverly designed. Uh, so there's an item on the joinery handles, these machined metal couple handles. We've been able to providence them. The 3D tour enables us to layer, again, the object, the experience, the people, the stories, but also the wear and tear.
The materiality is a home, garden, contents, an aesthetic, a precinct, a national treasure, and let's be frank, a damaged artifact. Damaged in the challenge of maintaining the physical object, but also, in a sense, damaged in maintaining its cultural status. So, one of the really interesting things that we got when, when the Australiana tour visited Manning Clark House in March was, why are you still calling it Manning Clark House? The most emphatic presence in the house is Dimpfner. She is the housewife, if you like, no less academically qualified than her husband, but that made this house livable. It's her who established the garden. It's her who made this a home. But why do you call it Manning Clark House again? Because actually Manning Clark does not mean that much to a new generation, the Canberra modern generation. What they want to experience is this as an icon again of a certain kind of aesthetic, which was part of a generational experience. What they also want to experience it as, though, is not that pure frozen moment, but of how this place is lived in, which is partly why I showed you that brief excerpt of three of the Clark brothers talking about the intense frugality of the house. But also, again, I won't click on this hyperlink because I'm already running out of time, the intimacy with which those who were associated with the house spoke about this over a period of time. So, Manning Clark House was once a controversial figure. Think the 1970s and 1980s, but is scarcely recognisable to subsequent generations. Dimfna Clark was a deeply admirable woman of immense intelligence and endurance, but the deeply gendered bargain she struck in keeping that house together, including chickens, an orchard, a kitchen garden, and immense hospitality, are hard to explain to a current generation. The house, the block, the pressures of redevelopment you, are all part of the story. It's all under pressure is so much Canberra modern architecture is, but how do we seek to preserve it? I must admit, I have a particular, another particular association with Manning Clark House. This is the view out through the kitchen to what Dimfner would always call the game keeper's cottage. And in pure self-indulgence, here's a little bit of me. Dimfner loved many aspects of the house that Robin Boyd had designed for her, but there were several aspects that she found really quite odd to have come from an eminent architect. One was that he provided no shade for the windows, so the front of the house always got incredibly hot. The other was that Boyd designed a, gar a garage that the car couldn't get into because it was aligned in the wrong way with the house. The old garage was converted into a flat in about 69, and since then there has been a whole succession, I think up to almost 30, of people who have been living in there, sometimes paying rent and sometimes looking after the house. In my case, I first moved into the shed in 1984 when I'd just begun my PhD thesis at the ANU, not because I was directly interested in Manning Clark, though I had met him, but I had bumped into him at the ANU and he, and he said, what are you doing, Mr. Brown? And I said, I've just commenced a PhD scholarship and I'm wondering where I might study. And he said, well, my wife's looking for somebody to live behind our place. Why don't you contact her? So I did, and I moved into that, that shed, that one-room shack, which still has some very distinctive Robin Boyd features, a bag cement brick wall and a sloping roof, but was pretty basic, but really comfortable and a wonderful place to be for the three and a bit years that I spent there. I lived essentially a self-contained life. My duties were to water the garden, mow the lawn, chop some wood, uh, look after the chickens who adjoined me, and the chickens came with rats that I didn't entertain. That's enough of me. Let me go back to my PowerPoint. So my basic, what I'm trying to get here at here is what is Manning Clark House? How does it hit? In, how does it fit in the story of Canberra's modernism? Okay. <clears throat> my point so far can be summarized as the challenges, but reward, the challenges and rewards of integrating Canberra's distinctive history into that of the Australia that made it. Second, the equally and related challenges of dealing with the modern as cultural heritage, given its inherent and deep ambiguities, but also its unsteady positioning in relation to our sense of when history stops, when the contemporary begins, and the fragile space in between. And thirdly, the way in which Manning Clark House might help to think, think about the, that space in between, capturing as it does so many variations in modernism. 
there is the design, there are the lives lived within it, there are the questions about how effectively to deal with the kind of generationally transitional space that matters to some in terms of memory, to others in terms of history, and perhaps to most of us as neither one or the other. And where to place or define or protect the value of such a place space with its great integrity, its where, its ambiguous role, and its simple, fundamental, economic pressures. How do you sustain such objects in such a straightened environment? Dimpfner's point in creating Manning Clark House was that it must not be a museum. It must be, as she put it, a place of ideas. But the tension between using that space for talks, conferences, workshops, and trying to preserve it as it was at the time of Dimpfner's death, as an exemplar of some of a particular way of living are enduring. It's not a museum, it's a place of gathering. But those two things confront each other, they wear against each other in day-to-day -day attrition. Every time we have a public occasion, somebody leans against the John Percival painting in the living room and another small flake of paint falls off. So let's take the Percival painting down, let's put it somewhere else. But it's an integral part of the house in which the Clarks lived. It's part of their aesthetic. And to some extent, the paint was already falling off when they lived there. So again, it's a question of what do you value and how? So the next part of this talk is to seek to develop some of these tensions because Canberra's modern has never been simple, one dimensional or pure. It has always been a bargain. As Jennifer mentioned, I'm on the board of Canberra Museum and Gallery, and one of the great collections that, can, that, that CMAG acquired relatively recently was a huge collection of photographs over four to five decades of, held by the, of the, Fair, the Fairfax newspaper group. Photographs taken over that period of time of Canberra. And the power of those photographs, as so often with photographs, is that they capture both the ways in which Australia wanted to see Canberra but also the reality of what Canberra was. They're a wonderful asset. How did a major metropolitan paper see Canberra? Well, they can be really riveting to go back through. So here we have, if we're talking about Canberra's modern, the domestic home in Canberra, here is a photograph of the mid 1950s, the dejected young female public servant arriving for career, but all she can get access to is a room in a hostel. Until her status, ideally in marriage, but then she would lose her job, got her access to one of these. The purpose built designed houses built row upon row by the enlightened National Capital Development Commission. Uh, the houses are perfect, the road's not in yet, the tyres are flat on a scooter, but nonetheless, this is suburban ideals. That she was a public servant. If she were a manual or construction worker still in Canberra in the 1950s and into the 1960s, the option might be one of these, a prefabricated home on a numbered street, not the neatly curving streets that surround Manning Clark House in Forest, but the linear numbered streets, and certainly not Tasmania Circle, but one, two, three in Narrabunda a working class suburb, or if they were very unlucky, still in the 1950s and the 1960s, they might be allocated this essentially temporary housing, though it was still there in the 1980s, at the causeway, never even designated as a suburb, now subsumed as a kind of ersatz canal-based precinct called Kingston Foreshore, but that's what it looked like in the 1960s. At least they would not be offered one of these. These were from an interwar workers' settlement, pretty much on the shoulders of where New Parliament House sits, which were essentially timber, uninsulated, sometimes on wheels so they could be moved around, uh, houses provided for those who were working on infrastructure, roads, sewers, public buildings. We don't want them to stay, we want them to move on, so we won't give them a home. They were there, though, however very conscious that they were in a national capital and as such the city provided reluctantly spaces in which this kind of diversity and emerging forms of civic protest associated with them emerged. Again, one of the striking things about the Fairfax collection is that it takes us to another side of Canberra as the modern city, a city of protest, the religious protest, 
the rural protest, the immigrant communities with a temper not always congenial to the rest and with politics that could not left behind in Europe. Women across the range of political identities. We want families or we want access to abortion. And of course, indigenous Australians. Again, what that Fairfax collection captures on the one hand is the huge diversity of domestic Canberra, but also the huge diversity of Canberra as a national capital. And all of that in what remained a small intimate community where global politics, now that they had some real purchase of, on Australia, were conducted next door. Some of my favorite photographs from the Fairfax collection are these. They're a little bit topical in a way. That's a camera trained through the fence of the Soviet embassy in 1954 at the time of the Petrov defection. As the staff of the Soviet embassy take large boxes of files out into the garden and burn them. And they're watched by people in the street in an embassy, which is essentially simply in a suburban precinct. Modern politics, close up, informal. This is what Canberra also has to offer, a very different scale to the ways in which people experienced the dramatic politics unfolding in their personal lives and in the world around them. Again, this might seem to be a long way from what I ought to be talking about to the Australiana Society, but my point is this, appreciating this scale, this proximity, this layering, these variations on the modernity of politics, identity, mobility, interconnection, even intimacy is, I think, part of what Canberra can tell us as a crafted artefact. It's there in the spaces of the of the city. It's there in the domestic shapes of the city. It's there in the way in which the city structures itself as that fusion, again, as Kevin Fay celebrated, between the important aesthetics and the local sensibility that is so important. And valuing it, Canberra as a kind of heritage artifact in itself means taking these less tangible dimensions seriously in ways I think that Kevin Fay would have appreciated, supported and, guide, and, and guided. Canberra's development had the privilege of being once invested with exploring aspects, ideal aspects of that modernity. So one of the, the great books ever written about Canberra was by Hugh Stretton in 1970, Ideas for Australian Cities, that looked, if you like, at the next iteration of suburban development in Canberra. Not the causeway, not the, the Clark precinct, but the new suburbs of the, of the satellite towns, Woden. Western Creek, uh, Belconnen, Tuggeron. And as Stratton pointed out in 1970, Canberra offered a quiet revolution in the quality of Australian lives. Suburbs designed for families, community centres premised on accessibility, a social mix in place of what has once been scandalous stratification. And you can see that scandalous stratification still in the area around Manning Clark House. Why did scientists, why did academics, why did senior public servants get the big blocks? and people who are working with, in trades get the little blocks, the prefabricated houses, the temporary houses. There are other dimensions to this as well that I don't have time to go into, but again, Canberra as a site of experimentation, a site of modern experimentation, often exemplif presented its modernity in other striking ways. I had the great privilege of attending, of being one of the first enrolments into the ACT's secondary college system. Secondary college system was often presented and should be seen as a, as a celebration of what an affluent city could offer year 11 and 12 students in terms of the opportunity to explore their own interests, their own, their own aspirations in their education. One of the arguments, and I won't read this quote, you can probably see it for yourself, one of the arguments that lay behind prioritising the development of the secondary college system in the ACT was these children of well-educated, elderly, <coughs> well-educated, upwardly mobile, career-pressured public servants are alienated. They're, they're lacking the security of, of families, the desire, the discernibly hierarchical nature of a public service town and the relatively high proportion of married women in paid work are among the factors found to be contributing to a mounting pressure of expectation among Canberra's youth. How do we recognise the level of alienation, the demands that students felt to conform to the narratives of career, status and security, dividing their, driving their parents?
it's another pressure of modernity. It's another way in which Canberra was a laboratory, not so much of an ideal, but of tensions. I am moving towards a conclusion for those of you who want to go and put your dinner on. So then we get self-government and the self-government generation. From 1989, the refrain was, you're on your own, normalise, pay your way. Yes, we now have more control over our own affairs and perhaps we've become more comfortable in our skins, a real community, a real place to be. But I've recently been working with an honor student. And again, what's interesting is, is, is the fresh ways in which a young pair of eyes can see Canberra. And this honor student uh, has written a very powerful thesis about what in the 19, late 1950s was an exemplar of the ways in which architectural modernism might capture the diversity of people moving to Canberra, not necessarily families, but young professionals, unmarried couples who might still want to have the opportunity to live independently in studio style accommodation. And the Northbourne Avenue house increasing, those of you who know Canberra might know that it was there on the gateway to kind of say you are now arriving in a modern city. It was Swedish style architecture, if you like, at the time. Except gradually modernism, this kind of modernism, rather than social housing to assist those who have aspirations to live in the city, becomes welfare housing for those who are marginalised in the city and eventually becomes a site of demolition because we actually no longer want this kind of social or welfare, low density housing or medium density housing in the city. We want to develop the city as a more cosmopolitan, a more intensively developed residentially mixed community appealing to a very different constituency. And so through a very, very complicated series of heritage debates, the Northbourne Avenue housing precinct is largely now demolished. And in its place, Canberra is developing a different kind of sense of identity. Canberra has its outer suburbs, its western suburbs, just as most Australian cities have, where people are kind of fighting back in terms of their their underprivileged, their desire to be heard, their identity as being on the margins, their identity as being a different phase of immigrants who are arriving not as a skilled craftsman of the 1960s and 1970s, but as refugees also seeking to find their space within a different kind of modernity in Australia and, and in Canberra and a different kind of focus on an urban modernism, which is pulling, you could argue, in very different directions to the kind of quiet model achievements that Stretton was talking about in the 1970s. All of these, I suppose, I'm suggesting are challenges for heritage when the present seems so determined on telling a very different story about the past. But I'm, I suppose my point is it's in this kind of context, not in isolating an icon, an artefact like Manning Clark House and locking it into its lost modernity of the 1950s. But seeing how it fits into this story, I think that matters. Excuse a final academic flurry. At the moment, I actually just come from teaching a course on this particular moment of history, memory and memorialization. And one of the readings, a very powerful book from Michael Michel Rolf Toro called Silencing the Past, asks us to think carefully about what do we mean by authenticity? Is the authentic the thing that is locked in the past, lost to some extent in the past? Or is the authentic more that with which we are continuing to have a critical, active dialogue? As Trullo argues, and don't worry, I'm not going to read the whole quote, it's really just those first two sentences. Authenticity implies a relation with what is known that duplicates the two, side of history, two sides of historicity, of thinking about history. It engages us both as actors, who are we in this story, and as narrators. How should we tell that story? Thus, authenticity cannot reside in attitudes toward a discrete past kept alive only through narratives. Whether it involves, claims or rejects the past, authenticity obtains only in regard to current practices that engage us as witnesses, 
actors and commentators, including in practices of historical narration, which is why I showed you those images and which is why, in a sense, I found that thesis on how this artefact of the 1950s does not really get lost in its demolition, but in a sense, proven in its demolition, how we are not just actors, but also narrators of what it means to think about the authentic. And again, in a way, I think I took this from Kevin Fay, although he might not recognise the abstract ways in which I'm putting this, in resuscitating the idea of colonial craft, he was asking us to think about what do we learn from that particular synthesis of a colonial sensibility in Australia. Well, it's harder to do this with the very awkward, mixed, ambivalent testing image of 20th century modernity, but I still think we need to ask ourselves the same questions. What do we mean by authenticity? Be true to the past or true to a genuine deep interrogation of the ways in which the past as it relates to our sense of shaping the present. It's a feeling of connection that goes beyond sentiment, the story, the narrative, but it hears in our understanding of ourselves as active agents, as witnesses, actors or commentators. The fragmentation and diversity of the modern, that need to comprehend a social mix to develop that sense of individual responsibility and choice, but also, test how, but also to test how real such options are. Again, let me take you back to that notion of the alienated child of aspirational middle-class parents being central to the experience of Canberra in the 1980s is a challenge for us all, as it was for Kevin Fay in bringing us back to the need to piece together an appreciation of what makes an object so deeply invested with historical value, so authentic, so Australian. So let me come back to Manning Clark House. It's a place deeply invested with narratives. It's caught between wanting to be a museum of a discrete past, but also to host a program of events that honours what Manning and Dimfna Clark and all of those associated with the house were committed to in their political present, and it's still our political present, the present of immigration, the present of multiculturalism, the present of inequality and so on. But what is that political present now? Whose present is it? It's authentic for some of us, but not for all. It is like Manning House, Manning Clark House, worn, fragile and degraded, but that's its essence. But how sustainable is it and for whom? So my final little pitch is you can now, thanks to the great support or partnership Manning Clark House has with the ACT branch of the National Trust, donate to Manning Clark House to support specific conservation and heritage tasks and those tasks and that donation is tax deductible. And if you want to know what we need, or if there's something about Manning Clark House that might really interest you as, a, as an area for support, take the virtual tour. Walk your way through wherever you are a place here in Canberra and think about how that digital experience in itself is such a valuable new dimension to how we might think about heritage, authenticity and the crafted object. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, that was such a depth and breadth of perspectives on Canberra. And, you know, just starting with the two schemes and the opposites of the Caswell with the Griffin and then expanding that into how Canberra has developed in the modern, absolutely fascinating. I, um, I was particularly taken by the issues that you're facing with Manning Clark House. Um, the fund, as much as it acquires objects for the collections in the houses also raises money to conserve the collection in the houses because it's a working collection. Yes. But you've got a very much lived, and I like that phrase, degraded and used, and I guess that's part of its authenticity, really. Yes. Um, just absolutely fascinating. And I think your virtual reality sort of tour with the statements of, you know, the doors opening the other way, et cetera, you... The man who is, for most people, books on the shelves and a powerful intellect, you know, becomes Dimfner and the family of six kids knocking around. And I think that that's the sort of interpretation of 
many um, historic places that you don't often get. You know, you don't really get to that level of interaction. I think that's such a plus. And when you started to compare it with the Frank Fenner house and that notion of these sort of subgroups within Canberra, and I think that distinctiveness came through, the public servants, the itinerant workers, you know, the multicultural dimension now, but the academics, politicians, it was really a, a knockout talk. <laughs> Nicholas, and I'm, I'm my sure brain I've is... Not you out. <laughs> I have got, um, I've got a couple of questions, but the... I have got one because you must be, when, when I go to Canberra now and you drive around that Civic and you see the buildings going up so close and the hype thing is gone and it's becoming, you know, giant hotels, et cetera. Mm. It's changing in a way which is maybe taking it to losing its Canberra character more towards the elements of a Sydney or a Melbourne, you know, without quite being there. Do you think it's going to retain much of that in the face of what looks like unbridled development to many eyes? It's a sensitive topic, Jennifer, because I, I was on the Heritage Council of the ACT, but the Heritage Council of the ACT was dismissed some months ago uh, because of a range of reasons that I'm not really allowed to talk about because, um, because of some legal issues arising. And the public presentation of that was about deep dysfunctionality between the council and the secretariat that supports us. But what sits behind that deep dysfunctionality is an absolute lack of funding and an absolute lack of the, the secretariat to process the, the, the increasing concern that citizens are bringing about mm -hmm. heritage management to us uh, and the inability, the inability for the council to respond adequately to a secretariat that is always struggling to present the right to present to, to handle the workload that's coming to it. But what also sits behind that, I think, is is undoubtedly very large scale developmental pressure in Canberra. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the issues that, as a heritage council, we were seeking to I mean, those of you who are involved in heritage matters will know the community perception is that we stand in the way of development you can't possibly build that you can't possibly knock down that building and so on i'm not quite sure how heritage councils operate in, in other constituencies um, but we can really only respond to the nominations that are made to us by a community and i think the the, the, the big need and for for the community is to feel more engaged with the debates that they might have about heritage matters. So I have recently, as a result of the, the dismissal of the council that I was a part of, put in a submission to an inquiry that is being held into heritage council matters in, in Canberra. Um, not so much lamenting the dismissal of the council. There's, there's a lot of stuff there that I don't want to go into and can't go into. But one of the issues that we were really pushing as a council was we need much more sophisticated pro processes of precinct classification. Mm. Because if we're simply responding to this house, this building, this tree, we're never actually looking at streetscapes, landscapes. We, we're, we're forced to make judgments about uh, a, a house, a building when we really should be thinking about facades, the experience of visitors, the experience, you know, the, the, and what is really pressing on Manning Clark House at the moment, if I, I won't reopen mm -hmm. my PowerPoint slide, but it is the pretty much the only block in that very prestigious, as I say, the block it alone is valued at $2.5 million. So the rates that Manning Clark House has to meet are based on a residential classification for a block of $2.5 million. It is the only house in Tasmania Circle, which if you want to be purist about it, is one of the few shapes that is intact from the Griffin plan. Mm. It is the only house in that street which has not either been substantially remodeled or knocked down and redeveloped. Now, I'm not opposing that, as a blanket statement, but I am saying part of the value of Manning Clark House, and this is the point that the Australiana Society group made who came to visit it, is that it's the block, it's the garden, it's the trees. Mm. 
It's the fact that this is a 1950s house that is struggling to survive in a street that once was all 1950s houses. The Fenner house is really 500 metres away. It's safe because it's in private hands. Manning Clark House is in this ambiguous state of, of neither in public nor private hands. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, it's a very long winded way. Yes, I am concerned. I'm mainly concerned about heritage matters, about the, the lack of informed public discussion. And it's not the public's fault. It's, the, it's, it's, it's a problem about how we communicate engagement with heritage matters to a community that feels embattled, public servants that are under resourced and a government which is driven by development. Yeah, yeah, not not alone, probably. There's a comment here from Paul Hutchison. Um, the modernism of Canberra has changed. Canberra of the 1980s is very different to Canberra today. Canberra of inner suburbs heritage is different to Canberra of new estates and developments. Yes. Is it true, though, that Canberra's growth and look as a city has been more controlled and directed by strict planning laws and templates, very different to the organic medley that typifies other Australian cities. I think, again, I, I'm looking at the, some of the names that are participating in this conversation, and they will know this much better than I will, than I do. I mean, what the, the Canberra the Canberra as a national capital prior to 1989 was a very different place. Canberra under self-government is a very different city. Uh, Canberra under self-government, my personal view, I mean, it's, we didn't, the Canberra community didn't want self-government. Those who were in charge of putting together what a budget for a self-governing city might look like knew very well that it was not going to be a city that could sustain itself on its own, on its own revenue. So what, what have we got to sell? I mean, the land in Canberra used to be famously on a 99 year lease. Well, we don't see that really any more. Yeah, no. Um, there's another comment. This is Alexandra Grimwade. Oh my God, OMG. A brilliant analysis of the paradoxes that surround us. Modernist Melbourne is disappearing every day. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Um, there was an earlier comment that goes back a bit to what you were saying about the value of the Manning Clark block. Would the house have been an expensive house to build at the beginning or? Uh, it was one of the great things about Robin Boyd as an architect was that he, he took commissions from people that he valued and he designed houses according to their available resources. I mean, as one of the, we, we don't, we should remember more that in, as, a, as a soldier in the Second World War, even before he was demobilized, Robin Boyd began the small homes service, which was partly publicized through a magazine which was handed around soldiers called Salt. And it was saying, look, when you're discharged, you won't have a lot of money in your pocket. You will want a house. Let me help you stage the development of your house. So why don't we think about building something that's small but extendable, something that is modular, modern, reflects your aspirations yeah. that is within your budget. Now, I don't know what the budget for Manning Clark House was. It's not a big house. Mm. Uh, you know, clearly Manning Clark as a professor at the time was better paid than most. But it's it's it was built carefully to a tight budget. And it is, you know, if we think about it as a house that at the time that it was built, had to accommodate four children. It then went on to accommodate six children. It has essentially four bedrooms. It has one bathroom. It's not a lavish house. Mm -hmm. And part of, its, part of its integrity is that it has not changed really at all. So if you visit the house now, it's very much the house that I visited in the 1980s. It's very much the house that the Clarks lived in in the 50s and 60s. And that's not really simply about the Clarks. It's also about what you experience there is a, a very distinctive kind of vernacular Australian modernism, I think, that we're in danger of losing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, no, I can, I can see there's so many parallels that people are pointing out in terms of what's happening in their own cities. You know, it is a, it, it's a period in a lot of danger, even though there's a lot more interest in modernist furniture. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's, that's fetching very large prices. I'd like to thank you very much, Nicholas. You are always a very erudite and thoughtful presenter who really opens up minds to new perspectives and also on aspects of life that a lot of us can just take for granted. So I'd like to thank you very much for that. I think it underscores the importance of history in everybody's life. I'm now going to struggle with the word authenticity because so many, so many social media people are using authenticity as something to do with, I don't know, their image on a screen, whereas you have really underpinned what it means about how we look at and relate to our built environment, etc. So thank you for that. Um, on behalf of everybody who joined us tonight, and I'd just like to remind everyone that it will go up on screen. I have one new message. Oh, yeah, Sheena Burnell has said, so pleased I watched this excellent talk. Thank you. So, I just yeah. encourage all of you, go on to the site, take that virtual tour, not because of Manning Clark House, but because it is a really clever way of thinking about new ways of valuing heritage and conserving heritage. Yeah. No, it, it'll be very valuable to look at that. I think so many sites starting to think of the official residences with mm, virtual yes. tours. <laughs> yeah. So can I just say thank you, everybody. Um, the lecture for next month will be Tim Entwistle, who's the retiring director of Victoria's Royal Botanic Gardens. So that should be a good one. Um, but thank you very much, Nicholas, for your time tonight. Um, it would have been great to see the Manning Clark House with the society, but I'm just going to go back there on my own now. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank good you. Good right. night. Good night.